welcome to another episode of ClinBiz, where we love connecting with you on the business aspects of clinical trials. On today's episode, we'd like to talk to you a little bit about some tips on how to better manage your clinical study budgets. So we all know it's one of those topics in our industry. It's always a hot item, right? Um, finance is always asking, you know, why are we over, are we under in terms of clinical operations? So it's always a hot topic um, that inevitably we always come to on the same conclusion that we were not able to, um, we're not really sure what, what has thrown our, our budgets out of the water or things were outside of our control, right? But really there's some realistic ways, there's some practical ways that we can do to better manage our clinical study budgets. And so I'd just like to talk to you a little bit about that today. So when we look at a clinical study budget, um, you know, specifically from the sponsor side, I'm, I'm going to be speaking now. You know, we look at and we see there's two major areas, two major categories that are really take up the majority of our clinical study budgets. Those being investigator fees and CRO costs, right? And some organizations, um, some you know, CRO costs can be a little bit higher um, depending on what the outsourcing strategy is. Um, or what have you. But those are the two main ones. Uh, investigator fees can be anywhere from 40 to 60 percent of your clinical study budget. Um, your CRO costs can also again fluctuate but being the, the second highest or in some organizations can even be the highest depending again on the outsourcing strategy used. But when we're looking at these, you know, your study budget, then you're thinking, you know, what are the areas that I can really tackle to have the biggest impact? And that would be investigator fees and CRO costs. So let's talk about some practical things we can do. Start with investigator fees, things that we can do to actually better manage our, our study budgets within this area of investigator fees, um, some practical things to do. So one of the things that, you know, I've noticed that happens many times throughout the years is that, um, we end up planning our budget planning cycles or when we're planning for our studies we end up planning scenarios that are very different from what we actually um, and that actually end up happening right and investigator fees is is no different so the one big area that i'll say that you can concentrate today and have some practical and and, and major impact within your organization is when you're planning for investigator fees number one Think about the breakdown of your type of sites, um, your academic versus your non-academic sites um, within the U.S. For outside of the U.S., you know, you're talking about hospitals or some private practices. So thinking about the type of sites that you're actually going to be allocating and going to and negotiating um, when you're actually Man, when you're actually planning your study budgets is very important. Thinking about the breakdown in terms of percentage um, and the types of sites. And why is that important? So let's say for in the US, you know, some academic versus non-academic sites. Well, if your budget planning for your investigator fees to be based on um, smaller sites or, or private practice sites, well, you're probably estimating some much lower startup fees, right? Which they traditionally have uh, lower startup fees. So maybe you're uh, estimating two, three thousand dollars, four thousand dollars for your um, startup fees for your sites. And let's say you have a hundred sites in your study, right? So that's one number, and that's where you're planning your budget. But then when you're actually um, the time they're actually allocating the the sites in your, you know, for your study you start going to more academic sites, let's say, which the startup fees can be much higher than that. You know, it could be anywhere from much, let's just say much higher than three, four thousand dollars, right? It can go upwards of 15, 16, some sites even more. So it's very important for you to have a good estimation during your budget planning on the type of sites that you're going to and then having that breakdown. Well, are you gonna be going 80% towards academic sites and 20% for, for private practices or non-academic sites? Or is it gonna be flipped? Because that can be a very, very different scenario, right? And that can completely throw your budget out of the water. When you start going to some academic sites or some of the uh, larger sites, there's larger startup fees, there's larger overheads many times, and there's other fees actually associated with things. So you need to be thinking clearly on what type of sites you're going to be going to and plan that for with your budget. Otherwise, you're always gonna be a little bit off or a lot off, right? When um, you're actually start negotiating with these sites and having those costs come in. 
The other piece in an investigator fees that's very important for you to concentrate in, again, your budget planning stage is to think about what is the breakdown and percentage. Uh, first of all, what are the high variable costs? And by that, I mean things like MRIs and CT scans um, or overnight stays, hospital stays overall, patient travel reimbursement. So thinking about those things that may or may not happen, but when they do happen, they're a big cost, right? And you need to think about that first to identify which ones those are. And some of them, of course, are driven by your protocol, but some of them may not be. And then the other thing you need to think about is what is the what is the realistic frequency that it may happen, or at least give a good, um, a robust estimation in your budget planning for those type of items. What ends up happening in a lot of organizations is that we forget um, to include those variable items early on in our budget planning stage. And we really only see them during the negotiation or even after negotiation when the study is actually happening. And then a lot of you know these variable costs are coming in and they are not easily sometimes tracked in a large organization. They may not be easily identifiable. Well, what's throwing these investigator fees so off? Well, it may be that you were really not planning to have a lot of these high, high cost variable items happening and they actually are in your study, right? So for the, there you go for investigator fees. There's those two very practical, um, looks very basic, but will have a huge impact on your investigator fees uh, within your clinical study budgets if you do those two things. The other one is CRO costs. So uh, again, there's that famous you know, question or comment uh, or statement within our organizations that say, you know, where did this change order come from, right? There's always an unplanned change order inevitably in every organization with a CRO or with a vendor, right? And so what are some practical things we can do to minimize the time that that actually happens um, or address these, these types of issues early on? So one thing I can, um, I can recommend is that, especially for organizations that don't have these things set up already, is doing your RFP or a request for, for a proposal time, the time you're reaching out to your CROs for their proposals to do your study, that first of all, that you have developed your own um, spec document and budget grid, right? Your own type of template, however that may look like, it may be a template, it may be a tool, whatever you're using, but it needs to be your very own, um, in your format type of uh, budget grid, right? So you're going out with your specification documents, hopefully that's already something that's unique to you, but that you're also including to, for the CRO to actually plug in their costs and their proposal within your own budget grid format or budget grid um, type of template. This is super important, why? Because you're actually gonna be able to compare apples to apples across your different CROs um, that are providing those proposals, number one. You're also gonna be able to see um, much clearly if things were missed or tasks were missed. Um, and things are gonna just be easier for you as a sponsor to identify better uh, what was there, what was not. Also, take this opportunity to actually ask for you know your the feedback in your own in your CROs um, during that negotiation time during the time they're really trying to get your business is getting feedback from them because they're supposed to be the experts in that area is are we missing anything from the spec document is there any other tasks needed right make sure everything is included there and then again that all that all the different CROs are bidding on that same type of robust task um, task or specification documents but then that they're also providing the budget proposal or whatever Whatever it's going to cost in your own um, type of templates very important even if you just develop it in-house it's very important for you to develop your own type of template this will save you hours of time in actually comparison and it will give you a clearer picture of who has everything included in there and who has not right um, so that's one big thing um, and, and make sure one thing I, I, I suggest if you're able to to do that, you know, during those negotiation times, uh, again, that's the time to, to negotiate is right before you're actually awarding someone. Um, so just make sure that it, see if this is possible, especially if you're a smaller organization, um, you don't have any preferred or strategic type of uh, type of um, contracts already with your CROs. See if it's possible that they include some kind of language to take responsibility in the event that um, they have missed any costs in that initial proposal because again you know sometimes it's not done um, you know in um, in 
bad faith or anything. It's just simply people miss things. But uh, we've seen many times, right, this happen um, in different organizations that, uh, you know, later on after things that have awarded the CRO or the vendor comes in at a lower cost, the team goes with that lower cost vendor and then, you know, three months later they come back and they say, oops, we missed something in that initial proposal. Here it is and this is how much it's going to cost. And all of a sudden you're like, why didn't you tell me this before? I would have gone with someone else, right? And so it's very important that because that really creates the accountability from both ends is to make sure that early on all the tasks have been included right that the, the sponsor is not coming later and asking for some additional things and then um, that it's included everything they could possibly estimate at that point and that the CRO in this case or, or any vendor really is giving their best um, they're really their best expertise in the area and providing that information and providing the costs really that are robust for that study and not you know later bringing something in that shouldn't have been there and so ensure that um, those things are, are, are added there if you're if you're able to add that type of language in there the second thing is uh, make sure for the sponsor that you're really really making sure that every task that you want anything that you want that serial to possibly do is really included in that beginning um, contract in that beginning proposal because just negotiation 101 you have the biggest leverage for both parties really um, you have the biggest leverage during the negotiation time not after right so any discounts that you might be getting any cost savings that you might be getting from your zero the likelihood is that they're going to be giving the best that they can at that beginning stage if later you're trying to add service and say well later if we need it we just start adding things and you know we'll think about that later of course things come up that we didn't plan but make sure that you do your best due diligence to include anything you can in that initial document. It's really gonna be the time that you get the biggest savings and you're really, you know, if you're adding these things, these services later, you're, you're really not getting the best that you can for your money, right? So make sure that you have included that. So there you have it, some practical tips you can do in your organization today to make sure that you're better managing your clinical study budgets. If you like this video, make sure you share with others. Make sure if you have someone that you think may be helped by this video, make sure you share with them as well. And head over to our website at clinbiz.com and subscribe to our newsletter because that's the way you're going to be notified first of when any new videos come. And you're all, we're also going to be having some great news coming up in the next few weeks that you don't want to miss and you want to be uh, notified via that newsletter. There's going to be some special things for our newsletter subscribers. All right. Well, thank you so much for everything and have a great day. Let us know how we can help. Any questions or comments, leave it below and we'll be sure to address them. Thank you. Have an awesome day. Bye-bye.